Promise Theory Part 4 Scaling Goals from Leadership to Microservices In Part 3 of the series, we looked at how learning to trust makes it cheaper for agents to work together and form systems. If you don't trust the details of a black box, you have to verify them, and verification is expensive. In this part, I want to look at how cooperation emerges between autonomous agents, what makes it weak or strong, and how that scales reliably. It'll apply for technology and in human organizations too, with implications for everything from online services to mergers and acquisitions. How does a system come to make a promise? Promise theory tells us that it's an autonomous decision. Each agent can only promise its own intent. But that decision can still be informed conditionally by what other agents promise around it. If another agent already promises one half of an interaction, say a service relationship, give and take, any other agent is free to use that single promise to complete a missing piece in its own individual jigsaw puzzle to fill its own need. As humans, we prefer to see what's wanted match precisely with what's offered, no more and no less. But progress towards our intended outcome can still be achieved by combining imperfectly matched promises as long as they do overlap partially. Any superfluous or non-aligned parts an agent promises may be a strength or a weakness in the larger picture, but will never contribute to a combined outcome we intend. For example, a hitchhiker may want to go to New York, but a driver is only going halfway. They can still help each other as long as they're willing to accept partial promises for a partial outcome. In other cases, outcomes may be quantized. Say a coin-operated machine may need a whole coin to work, a half won't do. Being able to divide a promise into partial promises is the essence of scaling. If it's all or nothing, we may have to wait longer to find agents with promises that match perfectly. Intent is easy to define for a single autonomous agent, but it gets more complicated when dependency plays a role. That's when agents interact to form super agents with a collective purpose. In part three, we found a simple way to think about dependency and cooperation in black box scaling. A black box conceals interior details, leaving only a singular atomic building block. This is how we manage information with modular boundaries. A collaboration between promising agents is what we call a system. On the surface, a skin or boundary around a system, even a perceived one, can play a significant role in our perception of it, i.e how it can interact with agents on its exterior. Removing the boundary to expose the interior details of a system may change the way we perceive its operation. In information technology, for instance, people talk about the difference between a monolithic system and collections of microservices. The principal difference is about which promises are exposed and to whom. In a monolith, the boundary for observability is a single computer and all of the promises are kept on its virtual surface. They depend on the interior agents and communication between them. In a microservice arrangement, on the other hand, the boundary is replaced by a cluster of agents possibly running on different computers and the promises are kept by establishing remote communication over the exterior network between them. That's just a rescaled version without an obvious boundary. The details of promises may change during scaling, but something else too. Trust. Without a boundary, there's more to see and therefore more to trust. With the added overhead of establishing trust, each interior part adds extra cost and may lower the speed and responsiveness of the whole system. As long as we can trust interior agents to keep promises, we don't need to see them. Trust adds a kind of inertial mass to systems.
If we think about scaling then, there are two main axes by which to turn agents into superagents. They're called by different names like horizontal and vertical scaling, passive or active scaling, ensemble or dependent scaling, and even space-like and time-like scaling. What they amount to is whether agents help each other actively or merely work alongside one another passively. Remember, any cooperation requires both promises between agents, so there's some kind of handshake every agent makes, either individually with peers or collectively with a super agent, say an organization. In a passive cooperation, the agents don't interact with their peers at all. They all just keep the same promise or play the same role side by side like a blob of redundant cells. There's no bottleneck in this arrangement, and the agents are together only by virtue of having the same role. Any exterior promise of the group doesn't depend qualitatively on the interior promises, only on the number, quantitatively. In an active or dependent cooperation, the agents on the interior make promises that depend on one another, like an ecosystem each helping one another by playing qualitatively different or specialized roles to create the exterior promise. Because agents now depend on one another, they're bottlenecks to the collective promise keeping. This implies dependency and queuing of promise keeping, as in the delivery example of part three. The final exterior outcome of the scaled promise now depends on the interior arrangement. These scaling principles apply across realms and scales, both in human systems, machinery, including biology, and human-machine interactions. The placement of the monolithic outer boundary plays a role in the costs, perceptions, and outcomes. So, what happens if we remove it? The absence of an outer boundary frees exterior agents from the constraint of dealing only with the exterior and allows a promise to scale its functional arrangement differently. Each independent agent may now become a superagent with its own boundary. Inside these new superagents, there may have to be additional promises to scale the work promised at the boundary. Bottlenecks and crowds can appear on every scale. There is no panacea to functional scaling. The difference between horizontal and vertical cooperation is about dependency during interaction. The appearance of a boundary may really just be an illusion of scale. The bad news is that the cost of interior promises may change as you move boundaries. Not all agents can keep every kind of promise without help. The cost of coordination between agents is a subtle issue. Autonomy may be cheap in coordination, but then each agent has to keep every promise itself with no separation of roles or capabilities. A compromise is to introduce a leader agent as a controller or calibrator of intent. A leader reduces the cost of collaboration from n squared to n if n is the number of agents. A leader's role may itself be a bottleneck if it gets in the way of keeping the total group's exterior promise. Either way, if agents in a collaboration can't keep their interior promises, give or take, the effective boundary of the collaboration effectively breaks up. This can happen if there's no central allegiance or leadership to calibrate the interior promises and form a common exterior promise. Semantically, what we have to ask is whether arrangements remain scaled versions of one another when we make a change, i.e., do the agents keep the same promises and in the same proportions? If we scale the parts unequally, is it really still the same system? Will it play the same role and with the same function? The composition of agents and their interior promises allows us to probe and understand the scaling of exterior promises in nature, in business, and in computing. Only by paying attention to the details of composition can we hope to understand reliability, consistency, and elasticity in qualitative and quantitative terms.